opened my eyes to a semicircle of very worried faces looking down at me. What am I doing on the floor? And then one woman leaned in a little closer to me as if she wanted to tell me a secret that she didn't want the others to hear. Do you have epilepsy, she asked. What a strange question. And why epilepsy? Well, can you tell us your name, she asked. Well, yeah, I can. My name is, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Just give me a few seconds, it'll come back to me. Okay, well, tell us where you live. Well, yeah, I live in the same place as my first name. <laughs> <laughs> and then the question that was going to win me a one-way ticket to somewhere. Can you tell us who is the president of the United States of America? And I heard myself shout, it's Nixon! Oh, fair enough. Nixon had been president. <laughs> Only he was two presidents earlier. <laughs> the then president was Reagan. And so I cashed in on my one-way ticket, a free ambulance ride to the Washington Hospital Center Neurological Unit. And there I underwent a battery of neurological exams, a CAT scan, an MRI, a PET scan, an electroencephalogram, and a blood test. Later that afternoon, whoop, a small Argentine woman bounced into my room and said, hey, I'm your neurologist. I've got some good news and some not so good news. Let's start with the good. You don't have a brain tumor. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> the not so good. You have a condition called epilepsy. I don't recommend talking to anyone about this. It's considered taboo. I don't recommend you going out alone. I don't recommend you doing any sport. And your driver's license is suspended for one year, starting now. And you're going to have to take medication for the rest of your life. Not known for having a soft character <laughs> and a bit rebellious to boot, I opted to do the exact opposite of what this neurologist said, aside, of course, from not being allowed to drive and having to take medication. I'm autonomous, and I worked hard to develop the competence and confidence I'd need to educate myself and those around me on what to do in case I had a seizure. My next challenge, a 60 kilometer round trip to work and back without a car. Born of French parents in the US, I have dual citizenship. So I'm guessing that I'm rebellious because I'm French. <laughs> and because I'm American, I'm very, very impatient, especially when it comes to waiting for buses and trains that are never on time or on strike. <laughs> so to sort out my challenge, I started scanning the classifieds. And one ad just about jumped off the page and slapped me in the face and said, hey, you love me. Come check me out. Come get me. So what did I have to lose? I went to this man's house to see what it was he had to offer. It was big, it was green, and it was very ugly. But it was love at first sight. <laughs> it was a greasy old 10-speed racing bike called a Nord de France, so my French heritage was covered. <laughs> we began our venture together the following morning. Through headwinds, tailwinds, rain, snow, nothing could separate us. But after a while, the ride turned to routine. So I decided to spice it up a little. I started leaving one minute later every day to see if I could still get to work on time. And one day, I left 12 minutes later. And I still got to work right on time. 
albeit breathing like a horse and sweating like a pig. <laughs> a workmate of mine was so excited. His name was Steve, and he came running up to me and said, Marion, what are you training for? And I burst out laughing. I said, Steve, look at what I'm riding. This is just my transportation. And he said, but Marion, there's a bike race for women on Sunday. You've got to come and try it. Took a step back and looked Steve up and down to see if he wasn't making fun of me. And a step closer to look him in the eye. He, he was dead serious. And then, for some reason, a French expression popped into my head. Something along the lines of, il ne faut pas mourir con. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was the following Sunday, wearing skin-tight like recycling shorts with underwear on underneath, something that would prove to be quite painful. <laughs> bright orange wool socks, white tennis shoes with bright orange shoelaces to match my socks, an old t-shirt with the sleeves ripped off, my bicycle and I set off to discover our first ever bike race. So we did a few laps of the course to see what we were getting ourselves into. There was a short, steep climb and a wide, sweeping curve and a straight line to the finish. The course itself was only 1.6 kilometers, but the challenge was racing it 50 times. So after warming up a bit, I settled in between two women in the front row of the starting line. And the woman next to me <laughs> when was the last time you cleaned that thing? <laughs> and then she went on to say, my bike was custom made by Scapin in Italy. So I responded, my bike is from the classifieds. It's second hand. <laughs> and then I heard this noise. I heard a buzz. It was like a swarm of bees right behind me and it started getting louder. It was my competition. It was the women I was about to race against talking about yours truly. One of them said, oh my God, do you see that chick in the front row? Look at her bicycle. Do you think she's ever cleaned it? And she doesn't even have cycling shoes. Oh my God, she's wearing chamois, sh underwear under her chamois. She's gonna feel that after she races. <laughs> do you think she's ever raced? Nothing they said really bothered me, but there was one sentence that hit home. Do you think she's ever raced? The only person I've ever ridden with is my bicycle. And if we were to crash and take someone else out, it wasn't gonna go unnoticed. <coughs> so we started thinking of our tactics. We basically only had two, fight or flight. I'd say the most obvious of the two was probably flight. These women were better equipped than I was, have been racing, are in fine form, so I'll probably get spat out the back within the first two laps. But then there's the fight. The fight in me said, you know what, you can just hang on to the back of that peloton and just finish the race, and that will be your victory. And suddenly I got caught out of my daydreams by the race announcer calling us off. Three, two, one, and they're off. I put it in the biggest gear I had and powered to the front, and I was so elated to be there that there I was determined to stay. <coughs> Every time a woman tried to pass me, I'd accelerate for her safety. <laughs> <laughs> About seven laps into the race, my friend Steve is jumping up and down on the finish line going, Marion, get some cover. I look at the sky and there's nothing falling from it. Get some cover from what? So I call on. The next lap, Steve screams again, Marion, grab a wheel. I look over my handlebars, <laughs> front wheel is still there. Look between my arm and my back wheel is still there. I decide to ignore Steve for the rest of the race. <laughs> I just have no idea what it is he wants to tell me. Two laps to go and my tongue is about to touch my front wheel. I'm huffing and puffing and doing all I can to bring this race down and make it to the finish line in one piece. 200 meters to go, three women pass me on the inside, and it's all I can do to throw my bike across the finish line and finish fourth. I was elated. I'm tired. I pulled over and folded my, handle, my arms on the handlebars and took a look at the three women who had finished in front of me. 
And then I looked back and scanned the women still coming in behind me. And I thought, wow, epileptic and not at all looking the part. Maybe this could go somewhere. <laughs> we averaged close to 40 kilometers an hour. And my friend Steve was as elated as I was. So he created a community of cyclists for me to train with. And it was they who taught me what getting cover and <laughs> grabbing a wheel were all about. Once we mastered those basic uh, tactics, we moved on, let's say, to more um, advanced training methods, methods. So four years down the line, and I'm waiting in a room behind the podium at the US National Cycling Championships. My team and I have just won the gold medal at the Team Time Trial Championships. I've taken a second in the road race and a third in the individual time trial. The US coach is about to come in to announce the team that's going to represent the US at the upcoming World Championships. I've already run a few races that are considered criteria to make the team, so I'm pretty sure I'm a shoe in for the team. So in comes the team coach, <coughs> straightens his voice and calls out a name, and it's not mine. And he calls out another name, it's not me. And he calls out another name, and it's not me. And he calls out two more names, and they're not me. So I walk over to the coach and I say, um, excuse me, did you by any chance forget a name on that list? Like mine? <laughs> he couldn't bring himself to look me in the eye. He sort of <coughs> coughed and kicked at the ground and said, well, Marion, can't take you to the world championships. You have epilepsy, and that makes you a risk to the team. Honestly, my first impulse was to headbutt him <laughs> the way Zidane did to Matarazzi at the World Cup. But ever so the one to keep her composure. I took a step to the side, a deep breath, and thought, how can I transform this challenge into an opportunity? Two French girls had been racing with us all summer long, and they had kept mentioning in passing, oh, you can come and race with us in Brittany any time. And I thought, I have dual citizenship, so maybe I could race for France. So I made a few phone calls, and I flew to Brittany the following day. Brittany is the cycling capital of France. There's races every weekend, more men's races, but some women's races as well, and loads of people to train with. So I started winning women's races right off the bat, and then started racing with the men to fill in the gaps. I eventually won my first ever elite men's race, and then got screamed at by the father of the boy who got second. <laughs> The last race that year was a huge affair. It was the last race before the World Championships, the race where all the European teams were going to go to fine-tune themselves before the world. I won the first stage, and I took third in the individual time trial behind two reigning world champions. I had just stuck my foot in the door of a new international cycling career. After the race, the French team director came up to me and said, would you like to race for France? <laughs> well, yeah, of course I would. In 1991, for the first and only time ever, the French national women's cycling team won the team time trial at the World Championships in Stuttgart, Germany. So wearing my new world champion jersey and a gold medal around my neck, I started walking down the stairs of the podium and I see a man waiting for me at the bottom step. I get to his level and I see it's the US team coach who hadn't selected me on the US team the year before. He has a huge grin on his face, puts out his hand and says, well done, that was so amazing to watch. And you know what? I take partial credit for that victory because had I chosen you to ride for the US, it would have been too easy. You wouldn't have wanted it as hard, as much, and you wouldn't have worked as hard. Okay, <laughs> so I just thought to each his own, and I shook his hand back and smiled and said, best of luck with your team, 
And then I went off to celebrate with mine. Epilepsy has pushed me to push myself harder. I pushed myself to six world titles, a world record, two Olympic silvers, a sub three hour marathon, and over 300 victories. I have epilepsy, but epilepsy doesn't have me. Obstacles have often become opportunities for me because I've dared. I've dared to have the will to find the way. I've dared to not ponder on why I couldn't, but concentrate on how I can. So I dare you to give the middle finger to convention. <laughs> I won't do that here. And I, and I dare you to dare yourselves to release your potential and to realize your wildest dreams. <laughs>